Hey guys, this is Raz, and we're going to be talking this week with a good friend of mine, John Drogan, who was Ted Cruz's campaign manager through his 2012 election to the Senate and worked as a state director there in his first couple years as a United States Senator. But before we get started with that, I got a few questions from people asking about our sponsor, Campaign Sidekick. I hope you'll go to campaignsidekick.vote to find out more about what they can do for you. But at its core, every campaign needs to be able to reach voters. And two of the most effective ways, anecdotally, scientifically, across the board, are on the phone and at the door. And Campaign Psychic is the absolute best program out there to provide you with ways for your campaign to go out and touch these voters, log this interaction, and be able to take action on that data throughout your campaign. So I highly recommend you check them out. And one of the great things is they also have to be one of the most reasonably priced platforms out there. So go to campaignsidekick.vote, check them out, and be sure to let them know that we sent you. Let's get to the interview. This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to the How to Run for Office podcast from My Campaign Coach. This week's guest is John Drogan. Drogan has been a longtime friend of mine and somebody I've worked in the conservative political trenches with for many years. He was actually also my boss, serving as Senator Cruz's state director when I was on the senator staff. He's currently operating his own consulting shop, focusing on digital marketing and political strategy for political and corporate clients. Now, Drogan's political resume is a long one, and we're going to talk a lot about that and his history during this interview. But what most people know him for is his time as campaign manager for Senator Ted Cruz's long shot Senate candidacy in 2012. He's known Senator Cruz for eight years and was critical to the success of his 2012 candidacy and his early success in the Senate. John and his bride Mandy live in Austin, Texas, and are new parents to the beautiful Grace Marie. As always, Drogan, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Absolutely, Raz. Great to be here. Great to talk to you. Well, it is always a pleasure. We don't get to talk as much as we used to when you're my boss, but uh, I, I definitely always enjoy the opportunity. Let's uh, let's start off by kind of talking a little bit about your background. You've you've had a lot of political experience, you know, a lot of uh, you know, digital and communications experience back to your know, time working with Vatican Radio and all the political work. Kind of give us the uh, kind of give us a rundown of your story. Well, you know, it's sort of uh, <laughs> it's sort of funny how life has uh, ways of uh, bringing us to places we never ne- necessarily expected. Um, I didn't plan to get into politics or even uh, digital media, but um, started out as a journalist in, in, for a couple years after college and then thought, well, why don't I uh, see what politics is all about? And I went to, to Austin, Texas to work on a Senate campaign as a volunteer and, and uh, they after <laughs> eventually put me on the staff, that was uh, Senator John Cornyn, our senior Senator in Texas, and after I think I, I think I probably uh, pestered them um, to, to the point where they finally relented and <laughs> decided to hire me <laughs> uh, on on that campaign in 2002. Uh, needless to say, the political dynamic was completely different back then um, than it was in my second major Senate campaign. Fast forwarding to 2000. Um, 11 and 12 with with Ted Cruz. So I saw a lot of exciting uh, (laughs) changes over the course of those years. No doubt. Well, and and in the interim between Senate campaigns, you spent time in a couple areas, but a lot of that time up in D.C. working on the Hill as a a press secretary. Is that right? Right. I was a press secretary after winning the the 2002 uh, Senate campaign, uh, replacing, you know, the open seat replacing Phil Graham. We Went up to I went up to D.C. and served as press secretary for Senator Cornyn in the Senate, and uh, that was just an incredible experience. And you get I, I got um, to learn a lot about how to work in a fast-paced, high-pressure environment, and that is invaluable for campaigns. We were involved, for example, Senator Cornyn was on the Judiciary Committee, and we were involved in the. Uh, really like heavily involved in in the confirmations for for some of the Supreme Court justices and those days were long and they were intense as when you're in the press office for one of the leading judiciary committee members we were working from 
you know, all kinds of hours and it was just a blast, but it was really intense. And I think that is, um, a lot of, uh, that that's a great preparation for campaign work <laughs> when you're no doubt. Uh, sleep, working a lot, working hard and, uh, sleeping little and grabbing some food <laughs> when you can. I remember, um, you know, my colleague and I in those, in those, uh, Supreme court confirmation days would, would look up and said, suddenly it'd be four o'clock in the afternoon and we hadn't had lunch or anything. So we'd run downstairs to get some uh, chicken strips and French fries <laughs> with, uh, with uh, ranch dressing or whatever to eat on the fly. And then we'd handle another, you know, 50 press inquiries from who knows where. And, and it was a, a lot of fun. Great, great. Uh, very similar to, to campaign work for sure. I believe it. Yeah. You guys, especially with Senator Cornyn's background as, uh, you know, being on the Supreme Court here in Texas. I mean, he jumped right in early on, and he was you became as even as a as a junior senator, he became one of the top guys in judiciary. That puts you guys right in the middle of so many of those fights throughout those those Bush years. That's right, exactly. He was a well sought after member of the judiciary because of his experience on the Texas Supreme Court and as Attorney General and the president's home state senator, President Bush at the time. Um, so it made a lot of sense to call on his press office and as a as a member of the judiciary and and it, it was it was a lot of fun um I'll tell you though Raz it was a completely different world back then when in 2004 I guess was was John Roberts confirmation for for chief justice and there was not a, there was not Twitter it didn't exist and and a lot of the social media w- really wasn't around it was it was uh, a lot of the conventional media, you know, the sort of right. New York Times and Washington Post and AP and TV of the world. Um, <laughs> now, I mean, I, when you have, you know, Judge Gorsuch nominated for Supreme Court, t- Twitter dominates completely for stories like that and everything else. It's fascinating to look at how things have changed in the last uh, decade or so. No doubt. And, and even in addition to all the changes that happened as far as the media outlets and the way you distribute information have to answer questions. Uh, you know, the political climate from the way the Senate acts, from the, uh, the you know, just the way the two parties interact with one another, and obviously with the new administration, there's just, it's a it's a crazy world there. We had Josh Perry on, uh, you know, Ted's digital director and a good friend of yours just a couple of weeks ago, and you talk with him offline about some of what they're having to deal with now. It's, it's absolutely crazy. I, I, I'm get, glad he's good at his job and that I don't have it because that would drive me nuts. I don't see how he ever, how he ever unplugs. Yeah. You know, it's, um, Josh is great. We hired him to be our, uh, digital director for Senator, for Senator Cruz's, uh, uh, Senate campaign. And you know, that, that could be a, probably a, a good segue into that era. Um, Josh is, hardworking and smart and uh, has a great sense for uh, for social media as uh, basically as Senator Cruz's voice online, uh, so to speak. Um, I'll tell you, it can be very difficult to filter through all the noise. And like you said, sometimes unplug. I have a good friend who works in digital media and he said that he loves taking flights, you know, traveling and getting on that plane because He's actually forced for a couple hours, however long it is, to, to shut down, and people cannot reach him, and it's just an incredible sort of uh, reprieve from all of the, the madness on, on social media. It's obviously a lot of fun. We love the social, we, we love um, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and so forth, but it also is so intense, and it, and it can become um, ca- kind of overwhelming. Um, one, one of my sort of um, I guess you'd say, you know, approaches or styles on, on Twitter is to sort of check in, not constantly necessarily, but sometimes I'm I'm more engaged than others. And I just think to myself, I find myself thinking and and, and saying on Twitter, by the way, at John Drogan on Twitter and, um, (laughs) shameless plug. Uh, We'll have links to all of John's content information. And I'm kind of surprised that in typical Ted Cruz fashion, you didn't just like rattle it off three times in a row, which <laughs> at John Drogan, at John Drogan, at John Drogan. <laughs> no, you know, that's, that's a great point. Just a quick sidebar. Um, Senator Cruz is very savvy at digital media and got in on the ground floor 
uh, when he first started running for office, he knew that digital tools would be extremely important to building a grassroots army in the way that it was. You know, in the 70s, it might have been phone banking and block walking and, 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 and mailing postcards, right? Well, today, uh, in 2009 and 10 and 11, when, when Ted Cruz was first running, he realized the blogs and the internet tools are the, the, the postcards of today and the phone banking, you know, these sort of old fashioned landline phones that that's, that's very much to his credit that he saw that and got in on it, um, on the ground floor. But, but just to go jump back to the other point, Raz, I was concluding that, uh, so, so I look at Twitter and I think to myself and I find myself often saying people just need to take a breath, <laughs> chill out oh, a little yes. bit. You no, know? and there is so much frenzy online now. People are working themselves up into a frenzy over tr Donald Trump or whatever else it might be, whatever story of the day there is. I mean, you know, if you if you want just a couple specific examples, the, the, the Jeff Sessions story about meeting with the Russian ambassador. I mean, in a, you'd think really if you see what actually happened there, I mean, he runs into him at a Republican convention gathering and then he has a meeting with him at his Senate office with office with Senate staff there. And um, and he meets with ambassadors all the time. And yet it becomes a complete firestorm and a frenzy on online. So anyway, I love the social media and the digital tools, but they're also kind of, um, they can get, they can uh, lead to uh, getting a little bit out of control every now and then, right? Oh, you're not kidding. I I've benefited from uh, being married to a, a wonderful, beautiful, non-political wife who that, that helps a lot with me getting unplugged and has done a lot for my sanity over the last couple of years. <laughs> well, that makes, that makes one of us, my friend. Oh, well, you got quite the wife yourself. I'm saying. Absolutely. All right, so let's so let's kind of start shifting more towards the crew stuff because uh, you know, after you left this Senator Cornyn's office, kind of you started moving, get back here to Texas, got back to God's country, and started doing uh, doing consulting work here. And then about eight years ago, nearly exactly, you uh, you meet this guy named Ted Cruz. Yep, exactly. I. Um was here in Austin, as you mentioned, I was doing a little bit of consulting, just kind of thinking about my next moves in life and started to build up a little consulting practice. And I, and I was introduced to Ted, uh, excuse me, through a mutual friend and he was running for at the time attorney general. And it's kind of confusing because there was no actual race or there was no actual open seat yet, but everybody thought Senator Hutchison was going to resign early and uh, there was going to be these dominoes. So we had this. So he, he got started running for attorney general with the uh, presumption that, that Greg Abbott was going to be moving up to something else. Uh, so I met him. We hit it off. And he um, as he mentions in his book, uh, I, you know, at that point, Raz, I had been what was it 2002 through 2009. I had been working in politics for seven years or so, multiple campaigns had worked really hard. I was, I guess, uh, just about 30, early 30s. And I didn't think I had to or wanted to work for any old politician who came around. I wanted to be a lot more discerning, I guess, is, is my point. And so in that sense, if, because so, so to that end, I was, you know, talking with him and he was kind of looking at it as sort of an interview process, but I was also thinking of it in terms of, you know, vetting him. We need great candidates. We need great uh, pro-life Christian politicians. Was That was my thinking at the time, and I wanted to think, I wanted to know, who is this guy really? You know, I have a chance to get in uh, sort of as an early adopter, so to speak, with um, right. this bright young lawyer who everybody thinks has an incredible future, and... Uh, I wasn't really desperate for a job or to latch onto the next politician after uh, my time kind of, you know, with, with uh, Senator Cornyn had run its course. I was just kind of ready for something different. I, I really enjoyed my time and experience with Senator Cornyn. Um, but I was just kind of like, uh, I don't need to just latch onto the next politician who comes along or next candidate running for office. So I really, as he says in his book, I asked him, are you a Christian? Are you pro-life? I wanted to know for real as opposed to whether he was a candidate who just um, said 
the right things to get elected. So mm -hmm. we had some moments, you know, behind the scenes where for, for several months in 2009, when he was running for AG in Texas, where I could actually learn who, you know, get to know him and learn who he really is. And I thought that was a really neat opportunity and a neat experience, especially since we had that, uh, you know, that time to oh, do yeah. that. Well, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, this is something that I, I respect the heck out about you uh, for, for being able to ask those questions. And I, I remind a lot of people about this because there's far too many folks out there that do campaign management or consulting or whatever. And they're so focused on, the next day they latch on to the next, you know, retainer check they can cash that they lose sight of the fact that the work that we do is to affect policy outcomes. Most of us get in this work because it's a passion. We want to have make a difference in our state or our community or country. But at some point, a lot of people lose track of that and they are focused more on their resume or their bank account. And so that that becomes the primary goal. And when you do that, when you lose sight of the fact that we're supposed to be electing and helping elect good people of principle that are going to work hard to affect the kind of actions and policy outcomes that we believe in, uh, you know, if we lose sight of that, that's a really terrible thing. And it ends up we help elect bad people or people that turn bad very easily. And you have those few mo moments, right, when you're first getting to know these people before you start taking their checks and you're able to say, look, uh, you're interviewing me as much as I'm interviewing you. This is a two-way street. This is a, this is a relationship. And I want to know the answers to these questions from you directly. And because I feel like I'm going to help a lot and I'm going to be a, a big factor in whether you get elected or not, if I come on this team, that's what I want to be. And so we both have to have confidence and trust in each other. And from the campaign manager side or the consultant side, that comes down to what are you going to fight for? That's exactly right. You know, I think it's, um, I think that um, for all the young campaign operatives and staff out there who are uh, looking to make a career out of this um it is definitely something to keep in mind there is um you know it, it is a it's a very special thing when you find a candidate and a, 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 to work for and a campaign to work on that uh you can really put your heart and soul into work your tail off and also believe that you know the person you're working for is going to make a real difference, is going to do what they say they're going to do. I mean, to me, that's what it came down to with Ted Cruz, uh, was that I truly believed he was going to do what he said he was going to do and keep his promises. And, uh, you know, when he, um, uh, what he campaigned on, um, I, I think we saw that in 2013, his first term in the Senate. <laughs> <You know, laughs> right. Where yeah, he, we, man, we hadn't been there two weeks. He was going to battle with Feinstein over guns. And he was a couple weeks after that, you know, really ticking off the Senate leadership by forcing them to, uh, to put their names in the line if they wanted to raise the debt limit. I mean, he got right to work. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and like you mentioned, there was, uh, the fight against the radical gun control measures, the fight against the debt debt ceiling increases, and then of course in the very high high profile fight against uh, Obamacare in two thousand late two thousand thirteen that led to the so called shutdown um, of eight, uh, which which ended up leaving the government eighty three percent intact by the way, <laughs> but uh, sort of anyway that's another matter, um, but yeah I mean it's it's uh, really exciting and rare i guess unfortunately it's too rare when um you can work for a campaign and truly believe um that you're going to make a big difference and uh that's that's very cool so all right so we get you, you get through that time where you're no ted you obviously come to a uh, belief that he's somebody you can trust and work with and and so you say okay ted we're gonna run this thing then you've got you know, the pivot from, you know, when it becomes clear that KBH is not going to leave her Senate seat early, you know, or yeah, so you know that we're talking about a little bit later election and we're running for a different office. Talk us through, you know, that shift and kind of moving forward. The, uh, <laughs> the A lot the, happened in a very short period of time. Yeah, in 2009, again, he was running for attorney general. He was, a, he was an unknown lawyer in Texas. He'd been solicitor general. He had worked closely with Greg Abbott who was, a, when he was attorney general, uh, had fought a lot of big cases, had argued at the US, U.S. Supreme Court, 
but relatively unknown statewide in terms of name ID and everything else. Running for, for, for state attorney general is one thing, but um, when the, the opportunity, when the idea for U.S. Senate, a U.S. Senate seat in Texas, the largest Republican state in the country, an open seat, is a huge deal. I mean, you're walking in the footsteps of people like Phil Graham and other giants who have gone before, and not to mention the 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 you know supposed front runner at the time David Dewhurst had 25 million dollars of his own money to spend and near universal name ID among Republican primary voters so most people at the time thought looked at the ra the, the race for US Senate and a young unknown lawyer named Ted Cruz and they thought this is crazy how on earth is he going to overcome David Dewhurst's money, David Dewhurst's name ID, and the just just this sort of general machine and juggernaut. Well, it was a fair question. <laughs> yeah. In the early days when it was kind of a long, hard slog, people would say, how did you get involved with uh, Ted Cruz? And I would kind of joke, well, I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> you were one it of the was, handful of people that knew him and just got suckered into it. <laughs> man, it was tough early on, but you had to believe that uh, you, you had to really play the long game. You had to really chip away around the state. It, Texas is a big state. It's hard to campaign here. And you've got, we had, uh, you know, we started the, the Senate campaign in January of 2011 we had, we knew we had at least 14 months and then, uh, you know, just one of those things in, that worked in our favor, uh, the rate, the primary date ended, ended up getting delayed because of redistricting. And, uh, so we ended up getting a, a, some more time in the race. The primary ended up being in May of 2012 instead of, uh, March. Um, but really going around the state, those early days, those early months, it was a real long hard slog and you have to when you're in a campaign um you may not see it on a given day uh the light at the end of the tunnel so to speak you have to keep your eye on the prize play the long game so to speak i mean raz frankly i don't know if any of your listeners are nascar people i'm not even a big nascar guy although my father-in-law took me to a race last summer it's fun um a couple of weeks ago, uh, I think Kyle, it was Kyle Busch, one Daytona 500. Uh, he only led in the very last lap. It was the first time he led, and I think campaigns can be that way in a lot of in a lot of regards. You have to keep your eye on the long game and uh, put yourself in a position throughout those first several hundred laps. Run a strong race. Run your game plan. Do the relationships you need to do, the, the ground game, block walking, put in your team captains, your infrastructure, all of that stuff. Build up your list, raise money so that you're in position to strike when the last laps are coming along, just like that NASCAR race, you know? Well, and, and, so and that's exactly what you guys did. I mean, you guys did not lead that race until just a couple days or a couple weeks out from the runoff election. That's exactly right. I mean, we... Uh, despite the darkest days early on and, and just pressing forward, um, <clears throat> we, we put ourselves in a position where we could win, uh, what, when it came down to it and we fended off, we had to sort of, we had to win what was this, this so-called, uh, sub primary with, uh, uh, some other conservative, um, folks who are kind of vying for the conservative wing of the uh, primary voting block, um, we ended up surviving through that first challenge, and that was sort of the first phase of the race through the first um, five or six months. And then we're on to the next phase where we try to make the race just about us and David Dewhurst. And that was, um, excuse me, that was um, sort of, uh, again, just a matter of chipping away little by little and trying to stand out above a very crowded field. And uh, like you said, eventually getting there to, to, the, to the end of the race where you're within striking distance uh, when you're coming into the home stretch. So before we get too much, we don't want to get to the end of the story yet, but <laughs> let's, let's go back to, so 
you know, you're in January 2011, you're kicking off the Senate campaign. And so your first task as a campaign manager is you've got to build a team, right? And so you've, you've got experience, you know, with a lot of the political operatives here in the state. You set out then to build your team. Uh, a lot of people lose sight of the fact that, you know, Ted Cruz is kind of a big deal, ran for president, is doing a lot in the Senate right now, and is very well known across the country. That's not who he was in 2011. Uh, as he joked a lot of the campaign trail, he barely had 2% name ID and the margin of error was like 4%. So he, he didn't, it was not well known at that point. And you're, so you had to go find a team that was willing to work on that kind of a, a crazy race against a prohibitive favorite in terms of name ID and money in what was known to be a crowded field. How in the heck did you do that? <laughs> it's a good question. A lot of people, of course, were either, uh, they didn't they didn't want to uh you know take the risk to 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 go to jump onto a campaign that they thought didn't that you know a lot of people said didn't have a prayer or they didn't want to take off the establishment um in texas who you know might hold hold grudges um fortunately we were able to find some true patriots um like josh perry and michelle lupton michelle was our after after me she was the second staff hire and, and was the finance director. Um, she'd worked with Ted before on uh, his previous race and, and just was willing to take the risk um, and raise the hard, hard dollars because it sure wasn't coming from much of the establishment early on. So she she busted, really busted her tail and did a heck of a job. Um, Josh Perry came on as the third staff member hired. And Josh, you know, is, a, is an insurgent-minded conservative warrior and that's what it takes it takes people who are kind of willing to really jump in the trenches and um for the good of the cause for the good of the conservative movement to build something great uh to do something larger than ourselves to do something really consequential and that's josh perry you know he is an insurgent conservative warrior and going back to the point i was making earlier about digital media. Josh was the third hire on a campaign that ended up, you know, having 25, 30 people total. Um, that again was testament to Ted's commitment to digital media and our campaign's emphasis on it. We launched the campaign, uh, early in the morning of, uh, in, in, uh, January of 2011 with a national blogger conference call. Uh, and that was, an, that was another sort of way of, committing to to engage online and then uh, Josh Perry be, being our third hire as digital director was a way of saying all right we are going to engage online we're going to build up a grassroots army and it's going to be using all the latest cutting edge digital tools so and then and then our um that sort of answers your question a little bit about the how we found people John McClellan was another uh, very early on hire as digital, uh, excuse me, as political director. Again, uh, another one of these insurgent minded conservative warriors. I mean, he'd worked for Wayne Christian and a bunch of other hardcore conservative guys, fighters. And um, John is a battler. And I would want him in the trenches with me any day of the week. Same with Josh, same with Michelle. I mean, that kind of team is absolutely uh, essential. Jason Johnson was the general uh, strat general consultant and chief strategist from day one, even before the race launched. Um, you know, Jason has uh, a warrior's mindset, and Jason is 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 a visionary thinker. Jason's a very brilliant person and wants to very much um, make an impact on the country and on the state, and have. Uh, and do something larger than himself, I think. And and so it was an exciting, exciting early team. I mean, Tyler Norris came in uh, as well. And a lot of the guys, you know, Josh and Tyler and, and, and some of our such great, great interns came out of the YCT world, Young Conservatives of Texas. I oh, mean, yeah. those guys were so pivotal. Rock stars. Uh, to, yeah, they, they were absolutely essential to helping get Ted where he did, where he, where, where we did and, and on that campaign. And, you know, because they were willing to believe in him and take a risk and believe in the campaign when nobody else would. And well, they would they'd put their blood, sweat and tears on the line. Well, and one of the things that I think is cool is that 
this campaign really helped launch a and give a lot of credibility to a whole new generation of conservative fighters here in Texas. Because due to the nature of y'all's race and how much of a long shot it appeared, the only people that were willing to take a, a risk on joining that campaign were people that had believed so so dedicatedly towards, you know, they believe so strongly in these conservative principles that, that Ted was campaigning on and that you and I believe in, that they went out there and they were like, you know what, we may not have much of a chance, but this is something worth fighting for. And through that, that meant that the, the bad guys, they didn't have a chance to glom on. They didn't want to because they didn't think there was money in it. Whereas the guys that joined up with that campaign team, they believe in the cause. Ted was fighting for that cause. It wasn't about his personality. It was about what he was fighting for. And so we had this great group of people that, while they had experience, they weren't you know, terribly well-known figures. But when you look you know, now today and see what some of you guys are doing from... Uh, from Perry still being with Ted to McClellan and you know uh, Tyler Norris and these folks, these are people that are much better known. They have bigger, much bigger roles to play here in Texas politics and the movement. And a lot of that started and has a lot of things to do with with getting on that campaign and doing so well, working so hard. It, it's really awesome to see kind of how that that campaign launched so many great people. Yeah, there's there's no doubt about that, Raz. It's uh, it's fun. I mean. When you are on a campaign, it's obviously better. Um, it's obviously more fun if you win. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. But, but the experience you um, you have together as a team is incredible. I mean, it is one of the most rewarding professional experiences I think you can have. Short of, I mean, uh, you know, the team building and the camaraderie and uh, the the sacrifices you make together and and. The, the experience you go through together generally is really, really extraordinary and exciting. And you can really build friendships for life for all the young campaign uh, operatives and aspiring campaign uh, staff out there listening. It's There is nothing like actually doing it. There's nothing – you cannot replace uh, the, the campaign experience actually – working on a campaign you can't replace it with textbooks and classrooms and and so forth i mean i recommend learning whatever you can about all of that but um it, it's just it's very very different to actually do it and so i recommend that to everybody to to work on a campaign and um make the most of it learn learn everything you can and and, and cherish the friendships and the the experience have fun i mean that was oh it's a blast the, yeah, I mean, one of the first pieces of advice I got before I started that O2 uh, Cornyn campaign was to have fun, and because otherwise you're just going to go nuts. It's, so, <laughs> it's a lot of hard work and a lot of pressure, you know? Well, and I think it's important to note, just to, talking about those people, these weren't just folks that you found on Facebook. These were people that you knew something about. And, and like Josh Perry told us a few weeks ago, he was he was interning and helping out, and he had met Ted at one of the YCT events, and let said, hey, I like this guy. He stands for what I stand for. And he started helping out and volunteering there over in the Vaughn building for you guys before the campaign was off the ground. He proved himself to y'all. And you know, there's other people that were involved. They didn't just come out of nowhere. They were folks that had been volunteering and doing hard work through YCT and you know through their involvement in campaigns for a while. They, they did a lot of hard work, and they showed themselves to be dedicated, hardworking, and loyal. And those are always a couple of the attributes that I say, look, we, I can teach you how to help run campaigns. You can, Drogan, you can teach somebody how to manage campaigns, but I can't teach those few things. I need to have somebody that has those intangibles when they come in the door. And and you knew that because of their previous experience. Because I, I always tell folks, look, if you want to get involved in politics, go just offer to help out. Because, you know, take out the trash, knock on doors, make phone calls, stuff envelopes, just prove yourself. And that's something that all of these people, to a one, uh, had done extensively before they ever came on your radar. No doubt about it. I mean, I think you summed it up pretty well. You have to, um, you have to be able to think, think fast, think on your feet, work hard. You got to have a lot of initiative. Usually, you've got, you know, be pretty, be a strong self starter. You have to be trustworthy. You have to be loyal on a campaign. It's just really, really uh, important. And um, the rest of it, you can learn for the most part, um, I think. So, well well said. Okay, so you start the start out with the National Bloggers Call. You've started assembling this campaign. Uh, we're talk, we're kind of getting through 2011. Kind of talk us through how you guys uh, built the strategy and, and what you guys are thinking and, and went through in those 
you know, throughout 2011? Well, like I said, the first phase was to, uh, I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the first points was to really place an emphasis on online digital engagement and activism. I mentioned that. Then the second <clears throat> big sort of thing that kind of dominated early on was raising enough money in, uh, to, to show viability. And so in the first quarter, we were able to raise a million dollars, which is a huge deal for hard money with federal limits and so forth. Um, then the other major thing, and, and actually the two go hand in hand, is the, the fundraising and this so-called sub-primary. We had to show the national conservative groups and the conservative leaders in Texas and Tea Party leaders around Texas, the folks we needed, who, who, who um, we needed their endorsement from, we had to show them that we were the most conservative guy who was viable and could win. Principled conservative who could run an effective campaign and take on and win, beat David Dewhurst. So one of the ways we did that was through fundraising, which is why <laughs> when I talk to young candidates or campaigns nowadays, I, I say, you know, you've got to obviously be solid when it comes to conservative principles. You have to have a great grassroots game and ground game and so forth. You also have to be able to raise some money. It really does help and it, it's extremely important. And the establishment, you know, typically has more money than we do and, excuse me, can, can raise it from wherever. Um, so that was a big, big part of the first uh, phase of the campaign, fundraising hard and then winning this so-called sub-primary to become the uh, sort of chosen alternative, conservative alternative to, to Dewhurst. Then in that next phase, we were trying to, like I said, make it a one-on-one -on -one race, really getting the media and everybody watching the race to start talking about it in terms of how, oh, Cruz is the alternative to Dewhurst. Cruz is the, the, the main challenger. Cruz is the viable guy who could take him on. And we really just wanted to get, get, get to sort of that one-on-one -on -one situation or scenario um, th through just kind of a drumbeat every day of messaging things that way. And Ted would talk about the contrast. We never got nasty or ugly or mean or anything. Um, but we talked about contrast between the candidates and, uh, we used a little bit of humor with some <laughs> online videos and stuff like that. And we also worked our tails off John McClellan and Kay Goolsby, our, our grassroots chairman, um, rounded up 200 endorsements from Republican women leaders around the state that we uh, un unveiled that fall of 2011. That was a huge, huge blow to anybody who's running uh, uh, from the establishment in Texas. I mean, that was a big deal. Um, so, the, so the race rolls on and, and, and you know, you kind of come to the close of 2011 and you think, all right, what's it, what's it going to look like? We're heading into the home stretch here in the new year, early 2012. And we don't know exactly when the primary is going to be. So that's a little weird because of that redistricting <laughs> challenge. <I mentioned>, yep. But <laughs> there we were, you know, it was a <laughs> interesting time. Well, and, and thinking about that, that whole year, you know, we gloss over it, but the, the way that you got those endorsements was not, I mean, that was a lot of work from John and Kay, but that was, I mean, your whole team, especially with Ted going around the state nonstop. I mean, I was, I was doing a whole lot of tea party events across the state. And I ran into Ted Cruz <laughs> everywhere I went and I joke about it, but about everywhere you could get four blue haired Republican women or a little, you know, a tea party meeting together with just a couple of folks, Ted would go there. I, I don't think there was a single event that it was physically possible to get him to that he turned down. He, he wanted to be everywhere. And that was a level of hard work that frankly, you rarely have ever see in a statewide office, especially somewhere as big as Texas. That was huge. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's extremely important for our success. The fact that Ted was willing to go around the state to small groups. And when I say small, Raz, I mean small, four, six, <laughs> eight, 12, 10, 12 people sitting around in hotel lobbies, sitting around a restaurant, sitting around IHOPs, diners, whatever, talking to these Tea Party leaders, these activists, and letting them get to know him, letting them really, really kick the tires. Well, the same questions that, that you asked Ted when you first came on board with this type of question these folks were asking him and asking him detailed questions about legislation and what he wanted to support. These are people that have been burned before on elected officials who they liked or thought they believed in that screwed them over. And this, I mean, we're talking about a state of 254 counties, 27 million people, and 
a lot of a lot of space, right? And Ted Cruz is want to go out in the middle of nowhere and meet with a group of hardly anybody. And that was huge. He, but more than that, he wasn't willing just to go there. He wasn't going to just talk himself. He was going to listen, to ask questions, and he showed these people he cared about them. There's no doubt. I mean, and it's 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 caring about them, but caring about the cause and the principles and letting these activists who are very smart people and know their stuff, they know policy, they care deeply about it, they think about it a lot. Uh, they wanted to ask him the hard questions on policy and issues and get to know who he really is in his heart and get to know his father, Rafael Cruz, who many around the state now know super well and, and got to know um, the, the uh, I remember very vividly early on, in fact, it may have been the second month or, or third of the race in, in spring of, or February or March of 2011, and I think that uh, Ted was flying back from D.C. at CPAC, and we had set up one of these small group meetings with um, a bunch of Tea Party leaders, and it was going to be at Stubbs Restaurant in Austin on a Saturday lunchtime. And um, I had been working with, I think, uh, J Jim Lennon out of Kingwood, his wife Robin, they're so great became eventually uh, such strong supporters. And anyway, I was working with, with Jim to organize this meet and greet with people who had really never met Ted before. And I hadn't even met them, a lot of them, frankly. I just was talking to them on the phone and setting this thing up for Saturday lunch. Uh, and so Ted was so committed to being there that he ended up changing around his flights and schedule to leave D.C. at about four, to get up and leave at about four in the morning to go to the ho to go to the airport, to get on a five-something flight on Saturday morning to get back to Austin. And it was a, no, not a nonstop. It was through Houston. And he gets to Houston on Saturday morning fairly early. Uh, and the flights are delayed to Austin so much that he wouldn't make it. So he ends up renting a car from the Houston airport and driving himself straight to Stubbs to sit down with these Tea Party leaders uh, and visit with them and get to know them and let him let them get to know him. And he ended up being, I don't know, 45 minutes later or whatever, but it didn't matter at that point that they were just happy to see him and, and visit with him. So that was that that to me is a, is in a nutshell what Ted did during that first year to get to know conservatives around the state, the primary voters, and, um, you know, stories, there's a lot of stories like that, too, where I remember one night he um, was driving home from uh, uh, one of the far Houston suburbs, I guess, and, of course, he, he and his family lived in live in Houston they're from there and and it was late and he was exhausted of course he had just spoken to a group of about 20 people maybe at a one of these evening tea party gatherings one of these meetings and uh and uh so he spoke there and he was driving home late that evening late that night you know maybe pushing midnight or something and uh called me up just to check in on the day and stuff and he was so exhausted and he said, man, I just don't know. He said, this state is so big. It is really hard to get around to everybody and to cover the, this, this state, uh, with, with, with groups this size. And I said, yes, but it is worth it and it is going to work. And, uh, you know, we just had to keep pushing on and keep believing that we were going to get to that, you know, last lap ahead. In addition to you know, go out there and working to, to secure those individual endorsements of the, the tea party leaders and those men and women across the state, you guys had a, you mentioned already, you had a big uphill battle to get a lot of attention from these national organizations. So Madison project, Center conservatives fund club for growth, three really big organizations that you knew were going to play, could play a deciding role from the, for the national side. And so I, mean, I know that you know, our mutual friend and my former boss, Drew Ryan, you know, you called him up and got the meeting set up and had him sitting down with Ted at Angelo's over here in Fort Worth. You know, yeah. Went back early on. I think I think that was the first pack endorsement you guys got. 
and uh, you know, Senate Club uh, Club for Growth and Senate Conservatives followed closely on there. Now, <clears throat> kind of kind of predicate this question with: there's a big misconception among a lot of candidates, and I mm-hmm. talk to people that want to run for Congress or something like that, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm just gonna go get these get those three endorsements, get those couple endorsements, and all this money's gonna come in," and they don't think about the hard work. You guys not only went out and blew the fundraising out of the water and were working your butts off on the ground, but talk to me about the process in addition to that for what you guys did to get those endorsements and, and how somebody should go about that process. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty, that was, uh, that was a pivotal part of our race as well. Um, we, it, it was, it was an in-depth process and a long, hard effort that Ted was very brilliant at carrying out um, in the sense that it takes multiple times. It typically would take, for, for a lot of these conservative organizations, um, it would take multiple times meeting with them, sitting down, talking with them, getting to know them, uh, and communicating back and forth and updating them on our campaign and how things were going. And, um, it was just, it, n- none of it was really like sort of cut and dry where you just fill out a questionnaire can, you know, that they, that they send every campaign and you send it in and then they make their decision. It was a lot more extensive and involved. Um, and they were super impressed by Ted from the beginning, but, you know, first of all, the question was, well, how do you get, you know, through this sub primary of this, these other, you know, guys we might like, they liked, uh, Michael Williams who had been in the race, uh, before and, and, uh, you know, they thought, okay, well, how, how do you guys distinguish yourselves from each other? And then of course, how are you going to beat Dewhurst? You know, we want to, we want to notch a W, um, and, uh, Texas, what better place to do that than, than Texas to get a great cons- new conservative senator? Um, so, yeah, you, you would have to fill out the sort of standard, a lot of the candidate questionnaires, but also meet with these um, organizations multiple times and really update them on how our campaign was doing, how much money we're raising, how we think we can be viable um, to beat David Dewhurst. And, and, and um, so we would regularly send them updates on what was going on and what our strategy was also. And that's the funny thing also about Ted. I mean, he's brilliant with policies, just a very sharp mind uh, in general, ex- exceptional communicator, rock ribbed, principled conservative. He also loves to get into the political strategy. And so that was <laughs> very effective when he walked through uh, with those conservative organizations or the, some of the donors, they'd, you know, they wanted to know the answer to the question, how can you win? And Ted was very, very happy to tell them and walk them through that, <laughs> that strategy, you know, how, how we plan to, to get there. And, and that, that was kind of cool, too. So it was really fun um, to see the, the process play out. Uh, Drew, you mentioned Drew and Madison Project. They were one of the first on board um, to, to endorse Ted early on, and then um, after that, um, we got to kind of toward the end of this sub primary, and money was a big factor, and the support and endorsements we'd started to receive on the ground were a big factor, and then Michael Williams dropped out, and after that, the floodgates kind of opened, and, and uh, you know, Freedom Works and Club for Growth endorsed right away, and then uh, shortly thereafter, Jim Dement and Senate Conservatives Fund Pack. Uh, endorsed and and um we were off to the races you know so now you've got that the kind of sub primary locked up you've still got five or six other guys in the race yeah but at this point your eyes are firmly fixed on Dewhurst. you know you've got to come out second in the in the runoff and you've got to you know then go win that runoff because there's no way to avoid it the only way that there was not gonna be a runoff was if Dewhurst got broke 50 so next you have to get him to engage with you and anytime we run against an incumbent, well, he wasn't incumbent, but he was a prohibitive favorite and a statewide incumbent. So his strategy at that point was to pretend that little old Ted Cruz just wasn't even there. He was running like he was the only guy in the race and not engaging, not going to town halls, not answering questions, nothing. So you had to, you had to get him to engage. 
and that's a tough thing that I know a bunch of other candidates struggle with. How did you guys go about doing that? And I know that part of the story is the chicken suit that, <laughs> that Josh Berry wore around the state. Yeah. You know, again, that kind of goes back to having some fun Duck with suit. campaigns and stuff like that. Um, we thought, well, how are we going to point out the fact that David Dewhurst does not want to show up to engage the grassroots, doesn't really want to go to these uh, candidate forums and all these events and these grassroots meetings and so forth. Um, why don't we use a little humor, you know, to, to sort of make that point. So I literally went down to South Congress Avenue, uh, just south of downtown Austin, and uh, went into a costume shop there, and, and there was a duck suit. Because one of our friends, our conservative grassroots uh, guys, kind of activists at the at the time uh, following the race he posted on uh one of the one of the blog comment sections it might have been dallas morning news or something like that uh he, he sort of offhandedly said uh well old ducking dewhurst is at it again ducking dewhurst and it had a i kind of caught my eye and had a nice ring to it so um one of the uh consultants we were working with at the time he said you know you should go buy a duck suit and follow them. <laughs> you know, you might, you kind of hear that from a professional consultant who's, you know, very sort of good at what he does and everything. And you're thinking, is this guy just messing with me? <laughs> no, he's dead serious. And so I went down to the costume shop in South Austin and bought a duck suit, a large white full sized duck suit that we ended up putting couple different guys a few people in you know josh perry tyler norris i think a few others ended up wearing it to wherever david dewhurst would show up and the press covered it and it was just fun and we'd pass it around on social media and stuff the blogs online and everything and uh you know kind of to build that drum beat about ducking dewhurst and in a fun sort of Light, light-hearted way, but making a serious point that he clearly does not want to, did not want to engage with the grassroots um, because then they would ask him about his record and so forth. So anyway, not to belabor the, the actual, not to relitigate the, the actual race, but in terms of the, the talk, the process of how it went out, that, the, how it went down, that's what, that's what happened. <laughs> right. Well, and it became a big deal. I mean, there were tea parties that were making graphics with like milk carton, you know, for missing people, uh, making their own little deals there and sharing them on social media. Folks were literally putting out empty chairs at candidate gatherings that Ted would show up to for, for Dewhurst since he wasn't there. And, and you guys were very effective. You knew you had to get him engaged. And yeah, I think it's fair to call it baiting, but you're able to you know, basically bait him into engaging. Uh, because you knew that if it came down to it, the two of you standing, the, you know, Ted and David Dewhurst sitting, sitting on stage together, uh, it was clear to a lot of us who was going to be the, the winner in that kind of scenario. Ted's an experienced litigator, stood in front of the uh, Supreme Court multiple occasions, speaks all the time, very quick on his feet. And him going up against Dewhurst, we were pretty happy with how we thought that would come out. And, of course, you know, we get to the debates where he had to engage, and sure enough, you know, Ted, Ted mopped the floor with him. Did you, did you guys, at what point did you guys see that start paying off as far as do we're starting to engage and how did you capitalize on that? Well, the key thing I think, you know, is you just have to keep trying to message the drumbeat uh, that you want and stick to your message and your game plan. We had the ducking Dewhurst uh, suit. We had actually, I think, a, a um, like a, like a, uh, URL, uh, microsite URL, duckingdoers.com. We do it on social media. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, some videos like <laughs> we did this fun video um, about a chupacabra. And at that time, I, <laughs> yep. I had never really heard of a chupacabra, but it was sort of this funny it, chupacabra is like this myth mythical uh, Bigfoot like character. And uh, so the video was, was kind of what are you more likely to see uh, a chupacabra or your own lieutenant governor you know and, and we'd kind of list the the uh, tea party events and candidate forums that he missed and stuff like that uh, it was pretty fun but yeah you just I think you really just want to have a very simple clear drum beat that you stick with and kind of hammer it home in that way so once you got once you got Dewhurst engaged and you've you're actually 
more or less going one on one with him. They started, you know, making up stuff, putting out a lot of you know bad negative headlines about Ted, and really trying to trying to spin you know some of Ted's background to work against him because they weren't going to win, uh, trying to actually fight his record. But but you guys had to do a lot of work to try to make sure that that did not get legs. How did you guys go about dealing with that? Uh, you know, pushing back against that, all the stuff that he, they were saying, and and winning those arguments. Well, for one thing, you have to build up the credibility uh, on the in, in terms of the foundation of supporters, and that was what we talked about uh, throughout the throughout 2011, and and to an extent even actually earlier during the 2009 AG campaign. You really need to. Uh, get some trust and credibility and have people get people in your corner who have your back. And so once then, then once the major guns start firing on you, which we always knew would come toward the end of the primary because of David Dewar's money, uh, we were able to fight back with our army of conservative activists around the state who at that point trusted Ted and, and he had some real credibility uh, built up, and so then they were willing to defend him on camera. So when Dewhurst starts attacking uh, Ted in, with with a massive with massive campaign ads about one thing or another that was never, of course, um, really putting his conservative credentials in question. It was sort of you know this this or that about his legal career, or Casey may have argued or something, and it was always sort of off kind of the point about um, who's the proven conservative who can fight for fight for Texas fight against the Obama administration, et cetera. So we were able to fight back in those ways. Once the sort of engagement actually started happening in full force. Um, I remember one day we uh, kind of did a call to arms of our, our conservative supporters from around the state who came in to film a TV commercial and it ended up being one of our best spots. And they're all sort of, saying very short, um, positive comments about Senator Cruz and, and his conservative credentials and so forth. And I think the ad really worked well um, to reinforce that, you know, he was the proven conservative in the race um, who was going to do what he what he said he would do. Now, we could spend all day long talking about you know, the different stories that came out of that from Maggie Wright and Connie Burton and, and all the different great things that have come out of that campaign. But yeah. I want to kind of take a shift. So, you know, we go on, we, we you know, get in the runoff, we walk away with the primary. And of course, at that point, the general well, wasn't given with, you know, we're in a red state with a strong, uh, strong number balance for us. So you know, we went on and won that. But early on, as we believe we win the Senate, you know, win the seat in November, uh, you guys were already looking and, and then afterwards building that team that's that's something where I think some conservatives lose some traction. What we we win the race and then we're kind of the the guy the dog that caught the car. <laughs> we got to now go build a Senate office right. and get started there. And this is where I think a lot of your time working in the Senate really helped. Talk about how you guys went through that process of building a team and, and making sure that you're ready to hit the ground running. Because I mean, 2013 you got to be a part of that, and that was a heck of a year. But you guys were on it from day one. For yeah, so for building the the team in terms of the transition in into the official Senate office. Yeah, so. talk talk through kind of how you guys you both built the team as well as your strategies for really what kind of senator Ted wanted to be. Well, a lot of that, of course, is kind of determined as you're campaigning. You have you make certain commitments to the voters, and you say, "This is what you're going to get uh, if you elect me." Right, in in that sort of old proverbial uh, job job interview sense right um so what kind of senator he was going to be was you know we had kind of a year and a half or so to well nearly two years by the time the general election comes around to to kind of deter you know to set that out in a very public way to the voters the people of texas um in terms of carrying that out i think that the, then the transition to senate office to official senate Senate, uh, Senator and Senate staff, that transition was all about carrying out everything that we had campaigned on and, and being able to execute that effectively by finding uh, the best and the brightest conservative um, policy staff, um, 
who knew what they were doing in that regard and, and some of the other people. I mean, we, um, you know, you have to have a strong chief of staff. I think that's kind of where that type of transition starts. And so we uh, did our darndest to uh, convince Chip Roy, and he finally <laughs> relented <laughs> after. Chip's uh, a rock star. Yeah, he really is. And, you know, he had his um, – he has his uh, wife and two young kids here in Austin, and so it was, I can understand why he'd be a bit reluctant to um, move his, you know, to, to to be a chief of staff up in Washington and go back and forth. It's a real, real grind. Um, but he decided to do it after a lot of prodding because of the, you know, for the good of the country and the conservative movement and to help um, Senator Cruz build this this team. Um, a lot of the campaign staff, um, mo- most of them moved, I, I guess lo- most of them moved from the, or a lot of them anyway, moved from the campaign staff to the Senate staff in one capacity or another. A lot of other people um, just kind of wanted to do other things. But, um, you know, you really, you really go about it by trying to build the best team you can to carry out and execute what you campaigned on and help whole, help uh, Senator Cruz kind of basically keep those promises that he had made to the people. And a lot of that came from you guys hired known quantities, both people that you knew from the campaign and from here in Texas and from other conservative Senate offices. I mean, Senator DeMint had just left the Senate or was in the process of leaving the Senate. And so you guys picked up a lot of, a lot of his legislative staff, people that you knew were like Ted and like you, rock rib conservative fighters. And, and that helped a lot on the policy side. These folks knew it, and we, you knew because of who they were and who they worked for that they were going to be strong internal advocates for the conservative policies. They weren't just going to be rubber stamping leadership stuff. They were in the fight with y'all, which was, as we found out, much rarer than we would have liked. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's, um, it's so true, and I'll tell you, there is – you know, you learn a long time ago there's Republican and then there's conservative and, you know, you have to have like on the campaign staff, you have to have a, a certain for your policy staff on the Senate team. You have to have a certain amount of insurgent minded um, <laughs> people who are willing to kind of get in the trenches with you and fight, the, you know, the establishment certain to an extent that uh you know, our own party. And, um, that's, uh, fortunately we were able to get some really, really great staff in those early days. Um, like you mentioned, uh, Senator DeMint retired and a bunch of other great people who we had, like you said, were known quantities. And it was, um, it was really an exciting time. I mean, it was, it was really just fun. And, um, you, you never knew, I'll tell you one thing I remember thinking very early in 2013 and just a few months into Senator Cruz's uh, first uh, year in office as a senator. Um, I remember thinking and talking to people about how I, I didn't really think he would kind of rise to that kind of that national prominence as a conservative leader so fast on the national. Uh, I knew he'd be a conservative leader. I didn't think he would become a national uh, figure as fast as he did with the right. attention from hearings and Sunday shows and whatever else it might be. Um, that to me was a little bit surprising. And I guess in part, you know, various factors led to that. Maybe, um, Jim DeMint's, uh, retirement and other things just c- kind of combined. It was very interesting. Um, at the time I remember thinking that. Yeah. A lot of people look at him and, and I think one of the biggest myths about Cruz is this idea that he's just some conniving guy that has had this plan since he was 12 years old of how he's going to take over the world. And, you know, while Ted is definitely a planner and has done a great job strategically thinking out a lot of his moves, so much of what brought him to the point of running for president and being the national leader is because he was just willing to fight for things and in a way that a lot of people weren't willing to do, take a lot of risks that people weren't willing to take to do the right thing. And that was from running that race, from making the promises he did to fight for conservative principles and to hiring the kind of people he did that were willing to help fuel that fight. And one of the nice things about when you do the right thing over and over again, sometimes some good things happen to you. 
and and he benefited from a lot of that. But as you say, so much of politics is is truly uh, kind of, you know, random stuff that happens that you have no control over. And from Dement to the type of hearings that came up and the way those caught fire, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's definitely uh, some providence or fortune, whatever you call it. Uh, a lot of that at play that helped you know, really shape those those next few years. Yeah, oh, no doubt about that. So, you know, looking past, uh, you know, getting you know, that transition team, you became, in addition to one of Ted's top strategic guys, you were put in charge of, of the, the state operation, the state director. You had eight regions, myself being one of the regional directors and had the state staff with a bunch of caseworkers and folks. So our job was to make sure that Ted was well represented in the state and more importantly, that the people across the state, the 26 million, 27 million Texans that the senator and, and that we represented, that they had the ability to communicate and, and talk to him. And so we were his, his voices here in the state. And you know, how did you go about you know, building that and, and really uh, trying to, to make that mission possible within the state? Well, I remember vividly in the first year, again, uh, the, the, the other thing that sort of stood out in my mind that year um, in 2013, besides sort of how fast he rose to national prominence, was around the state, everywhere we went, everybody we heard from, people said how refreshing it is that finally somebody in Washington does what they say they were going to do. It was amazing to me. I remember talking about that at the time as well in 2013. Um, so in that regard, he made our jobs very easy for us in, back in Texas. Um, the t those those kind of two things combined, Texans were very excited to have uh, Ted Cruz representing us, and uh, I I think that was a that was a fun um, experience around the state. And I, you know, I still remember the. Um, the, the coming back, were, were you at the uh, welcome home rallies after the so-called shutdown? Oh yeah. Yeah. Bruce and I put the one together here in Arlington. Arlington. That was, that was Houston. awesome. One of my favorite experiences there on the Senate staff. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Did you go to the Houston one too? No, I wasn't able to go to that one. Yeah. So you know though what it was like. Oh yeah. There, and it was, it was unbelievable. I mean, really, I, I agree with you. One of the most, one of the, the, the high, high points, real highest moments of our, our time uh, working with, with Ted Cruz was, was those uh, welcome home rallies. I mean, really just a, a, a true hero's welcome and really kind of recognizing and appreciating the fact that he uh, did what he said he was going to do and went up there to take on Obamacare and take on the establishment and take on, and even if I'm in his own party and uh, uh, to me, that th th that's what stands out from the first year. To me, um, I just I think it was really a special experience and a special time. And um, you know, we need more of that kind of courage in uh, in Washington and our elected officials and state level too. I mean, you know, everywhere across the board in, in politics, it's 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 the rare person who is um, willing to stand on principle, do what they know is right regardless of, um, you know, the next election, which is just, that's a whole nother matter. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those character traits is always in short supply. And I think yeah. is in large part, the, the motivating factor that's helped Ted do as well politically as he has. Cause I mean, I remember, you know, we went through the shutdown and as, as proud as we were for what Ted did and what we got to be a part of, we got beat up. And I remember sitting there with Bruce, you know, we had the, the Arlington Tea Party and others had reached out about doing this welcome home event. And we were just kind of like, oh man, uh, you know, is any, are anybody going to show up? I mean, we knew we'd had a bunch of support here in Texas, but we, we knew that we had, uh, we knew we had supporters, but we didn't know how much, honestly. And yeah. so, you know, we, we saw, you know, first we were like, okay, we'll plan for 200. Okay. Now it's 500, not 700. We had over 1200 people that Arlington rally. And it was absolutely just one of the most, pumping up experiences ever well jargon i know you gotta you've been very generous with your time today i know you gotta you gotta get out of here soon what um you know what kind of parting advice do you got for folks that are looking to run for office or or thinking about uh, jumping into a to a campaign job how how do you think they ought to take some next steps yeah so two two parts i mean to the potential candidates i would say um stand on principle stand for principle know what you believe and uh stick to it and uh be able to uh, raise some money, find a way to raise money 
um, through however you can and um, and uh, obviously combined with the, your grassroots network and your hard work and and your conservative principles that's going to make you a much much more viable uh, effective candidate for the potential staff and campaign workers um, I would say start somewhere I mean get on a campaign and do it it's invaluable you cannot replace the experience of actually working on a campaign and uh, going through that uh, and then as you do it um, have a lot of fun you know it's hard work it's 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 difficult um, grueling you know can, can be really sort of at times very very trying but um, but it's fun and it's 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 a sacrifice that's worth that's worth taking and just keep you know keep your eye on the prize and the eye on the keep keep you know the, the light on the at the, the light at the end of the tunnel and uh, hopefully you'll you'll have uh, more wins than losses <laughs> Well, John, I appreciate being here today. Folks, you can follow him on Twitter at John Drogan, at John Drogan, at John Drogan. (laughs) style, And uh, check out our sponsor, Campaign Sidekick, at campaignsidekick.boat. We'll have links to John's Twitter and how you get in touch with him in the show notes. And we'll talk to you all again next week. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.